Yeah, yeah, the bush hogging got done. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs>
Agrips up, cement up, I mean, everything he did was up. So, I mean, his product was going to be up. Yes. I talked to him yesterday afternoon. She said he was still doing good. So that was, I was glad to hear that. Let's turn to 205. 205. Great is thy faithfulness. So God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fell not. As thou hast been, thou forever. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have needed, thy hands have provided, great Lord, unto me. Let me lower that just a little bit. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Summer and soft in the courses above. Dawn with
76.
<clears throat> Good morning. Good to see each one of you here this morning. We're uh, thankful once again for the opportunity that we have uh, to assemble ourselves in the house of God. Uh, we're thankful to be able to be here. We hope and trust that uh, your thoughts and heart are on uh, worshiping God at this time. We uh, hope and trust that you've prayed for our meeting right here, right now, and that you will. <clears throat> we hope that we truly trust in the Lord and in the power of his might. <clears throat> I have uh, two thank you cards to read. Uh, there are not enough words to fully express our heartfelt thanks for all the prayers, sympathy, and support extended to our family during this time of loss. Uh, she was an amazing lady, and we miss her so much. Uh, we take comfort that she is forever with her Lord and Savior, rejoicing around his throne. What a glad reunion it must have been to be united with loved ones gone on before. We deeply appreciate the beautiful floral arrangement. We also appreciate all the food prepared, all the comforting words, and all the love shown. It will always be remembered. She loved her church family uh, with love, the family of Jewel Burleson. And uh, I think I can speak for the church family that uh, we miss her as well. <clears throat> And we hope and trust that she is in the presence of her Savior. Another thank you, dear members of Meadow Creek Church. Uh, thank you so much for all of your thoughtful prayers these past few weeks during Justin's surgery and recovery. The loving card and generous gift to our family was humbling and touched us deeply. Please keep, continue to keep us in your prayers as Justin's re recovery progresses. We hope to see you in person soon. Love, Justin, Casey, Reese, and Lucy. And um, it was sent, but it came back to sender. Uh, so they are here as we read that today. Um, <clears throat> we have several on our prayer list this morning. Uh, we want to continue to be in prayer for Sister Wanda and Brother Jean and Sister Ruth, her brother Robert, and Sister Virginia, we pray the Lord's continued blessings upon each one of you. Uh, Sister Dana, it's Uncle Ronnie Tucker, very low in the hospital. Uh, we just pray the Lord's blessing upon him. Uh, the days uh, seem short for him. According to his natural condition, uh, but we hope and trust and we believe that his days aren't shortened when we think about the eternal love of God and the eternal salvation that's given to every one of the Lord's people. And we also know that there's no sickness too great or no sickness too small for the Lord's attention. We hope that... Uh, Dana and her family and Ronnie's family can be comforted uh, knowing the love of God and the strength of it. It's good to see Sister Renee with us here today and uh, Brother Warren. We hope and trust that they will, she will continue to recover and Warren will stay well. Thankful to the Lord for that. Uh, we continue to be in prayer uh, for Brother Josh and his upcoming uh, wedding. We just Pray the Lord's uh, blessings upon him and his faithful companion. We just pray the blessings of God upon him. Found out this morning, uh, Sister Angela's dad, Brother Ernest, had to go to the hospital last night. Um, dehydration and maybe other complications from COVID. They seem to have, uh, he's better and he's home and doing better. 
Caleb gave me that report. So we are thankful for that and pray the Lord's continued blessing upon them. Uh, Sister Merlin is uh, making some improvement, we believe. Uh, she's taking less medicine, uh, pain medicine, and um, she's able, she's getting a little more mobile in her movement. I mean, you know, just being able to walk a little bit without the aid of a wheelchair or something like that. Uh, so we're thankful to the Lord for that. We're thankful for your prayers. Continue to be in prayer for Teresa Long. Uh, Elder Oots, we want to remember him in prayer. Uh, continued prayers for Justin. We're thankful that it's as well with him as it is, and we just pray the Lord's continued blessing in his recovery and the strength for his family. <clears throat> A few from No Creek. I don't know if I've said them yet. Uh, the Duns, the Eatons, Sister Bennett. Um, of course, we want to continue to be in prayer for the country in which we live. Uh, just pray the Lord's continued mercy upon us and this country. We're thankful for the freedoms that we have. We ask the Lord's continued blessing in that regard. Uh, we want to remember this church body here. Meta Creek, we just pray the Lord's blessings upon us, that he would bless us with wisdom. In the upcoming association, we just um, ask the Lord's blessing. I hope and trust that you're in prayer for that, uh, that he would bless us with a, a fruitful season, uh, that he would spare us, that we could uh, join together uh, that he would stir up the hearts and minds of uh, ministers and uh, non-ministers as well to come and worship with us. And that all of them would pray. We're thankful for our military. We continue to be in prayer. And uh, our law enforcement, we continue to be in prayer for Chase Sawyers. We ask the Lord's continued blessing upon him and his recovery first responders, all of those. Uh, I think I mentioned Elder Ooze, but we can mention him again. If I didn't, we won't ask the Lord's blessing in his upcoming treatment. Uh, they'll be able to get rid of that mass on his right kidney. Is there anyone else? Elder Richie Broadway has oh. surgery Tuesday. Thank you. Tomorrow, no, Tuesday. Yeah, today's Sunday. Thank you. We hope and trust that uh, all would be well with that. That's not uh, outpatient, is it? Or do you know? It's probably not. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, I'd like to thank the Lord for Kevin's well being. Uh, we were out cleaning up yesterday, and he was on the ladder, and a limb came and struck him in his head and knocked him to the ground, and uh, he seems to be doing pretty well, so thank God for that. <clears throat> Any others? Thank everybody for their effort yesterday. To, you know, we we just definitely if we if we do what we can, <laughs> that's about as good as we can do. And I'm thankful for each one of you that was able to participate and things of that nature and all that you're doing on behalf of the upcoming association. But I believe the the greatest strength that we have in preparation for this association is the power of the spirit that we have in us. Praying to God. <clears throat> no one else being mentioned. We'd like to. Yes. Did we mention Brother Evans' Oh, no, we didn't. I asked him as he came in and I wrote it down. Thank you very much. Sorry, Evan. Uh, we want to remember uh, Brother Evans' grandfather. Uh, he says that uh, as in. Uh, 
Ronnie Tucker, they have kind of given them a short window of life and that they've had a good season of being around them and visiting and things of that nature. And we hope and trust the Lord would continue to comfort that family and heal according to the Lord's power and will. Anyone else? No one else being mentioned would like to stand and sing a hymn as a way of opening and ask Brother Tim Heron if he'd come forth and have a public prayer for us. Remember him as we prepare for that. Brother Gene, what number? Number 43. Number 43. I love to see the Lord be Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Lord for blessing us once again with the privilege to be in thy house and to be able to meet together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship and to praise thee. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for thy church. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us. We thank you that we have the privilege to together and to fellowship one with another and we thank you for the Holy Spirit and pray that we might be able to feel that presence here with us this day and we have already in the song service. We pray Heavenly Father for each of those that's been mentioned that are sick and afflicted. We pray that thou would comfort and bless them and be with them. And those who lost loved ones, Heavenly Father, we pray that thou would Comfort them and give them a feeling of our presence. And pray, Heavenly Father, for this service today. Thank you for Brother Eddie and for all of the gifts that has put in our church. 
We pray, dear Lord, that thou bless him as he stands to preach and bless his mind that he might be able to think about those things from our word that would be a benefit to our little children. We pray for each one that's here today as we hear the preaching that we might be able to receive it and to hear it and to put it to use in our lives that our lives will bring forth fruit unto thee that we would be fruitful in the things of the spirit help us to put off this old man and to put on the new man and to walk in newness of life and forgive us heavenly father if we we've sinned if we confess heavenly father that we're weak and we're unworthy of the least of our blessings but we're so thankful for thy mercy and our long suffering and goodness to us we pray that Lord thou bless the little church here at Mill Creek as we prepare to host the association with our sister churches and pray that as we meet together and that we might have sweet fellowship with one another and that thy spirit would be the one in our midst and that thou bless the ministers who come and preach that we might be made to rejoice once again in thy great promises and all the things that thou hast left for us in thy word that are a comfort and a blessing to us that we might be instructed and that we might know how to live as we walk there in this life and that we might be able to enjoy a little bit, a little foretaste of that that we have to look forward to for eternity and being in heaven with thee. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, again for privilege to be here. Pray that I'll go with us through the rest of this service that all is said and done to honor and glory. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. We certainly are thankful for that prayer. Hope and trust that you will uh, continue to pray as I <clears throat> stand before you this morning. We're thankful that uh, thankful that God has left us, has set up a kingdom here for us. That God is a spirit. God is spirit. Um, and in that, there are three persons in that. Godhead, you have the Father, and you have the Son, and you have the Holy Ghost. And God came in flesh in Jesus Christ. The Son, that person, was flesh and God. God... is a creator god is love <clears throat> so as we worship this morning i would like for us to uh as we look in the gospels there's several incidents that well there's a lot of incidents in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there's several that are in each <coughs> Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded certain things that happened. All of them did. Now, of course, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and as we read each word, we come to the realization that uh, this is of much importance uh, but certainly if it's in there if god inspired matthew to write about it and he inspired mark to write about it and luke to write about it and john to write about it um i wonder why is this in there four times and everything else isn't in there four times or some some of these things <clears throat> so we'd like to speak about several of these incidents in the scripture that's 
uh, recorded in each of the Gospels. And as we, you know, as I said, as we began that, you know, God is spirit. And we trust in the spirit. You know, you can't see the wind, you can see the effects of it and things of that nature. And the wind bloweth where it's listed. There's that comparison to the wind and the spirit. But as we go through the goodness of God, there are things that God has blessed us to have an understanding of. This is not mythology. There are accounts that's given to us in the Bible that are historical and factual. These are facts. These are events that happened in time. Like if you pick up the newspaper and you read about an event that occurred last week or last month, I mean, it really happened. So as we go through scripture, this isn't uh, a philosophical view and something that's drawn up to have to give you this kind of good feeling inside yourself. But these are actual events that have been recorded by the inspiration of God that took place on this planet in which we live. These are real, these are factual events. So, I mean, I mean, it's easy to get caught up and say, well, okay, I mean, this happened thousands of years ago, but they did happen and they happened to human beings. People that hungered and people that thirsted, people that went through trials and tribulations that had sicknesses and had diseases, had to get up and go to work. They saw Jesus Christ walk this earth. Some of them that were blind were given sight by Jesus Christ. It's an historical fact. It happened. Well, first thing I think I'd like to try to speak about this morning, I hope this is of the Lord. would like to talk about the feeding of the 5,000. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record about, there was an incident in the ministry of Jesus Christ where there was the minimum. There were 5,000 men, and we would deduce from that, not guess, that there were many others. So there were 5,000 that were with Christ, following Christ out into a region, leaving the town. They have gone out to hear the ministry of Jesus Christ. They have gone out to hear him preach his gospel. I think that would have been really awesome. Well, it is awesome to hear the gospel preached. It's awesome to preach the gospel, but could you imagine hearing Christ preach his gospel? Maybe there's no difference. In Matthew chapter 14, and Luke, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6, I'd just like to go through this kind of briefly and then get to another incident or two if it's of the Lord. <clears throat> you know, as we live here in this world and things come up, a lot of things bother us. You know, there's a lot of things that bother us. And just about the first thing we think about is, well, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to take care of this? I don't have enough to do it, so this isn't going to be able to happen. How are we going to take care of this? And just about every account of the feeding of the 5,000, we see that play now. And the Lord, you know, in the ministry, there's many ways that he teaches us and it by experience is one of experience is one of the greatest teachers. So there is no doubt that the Lord knew when he was 
the multitudes were following him that he knew that it was going to be eating time pretty soon. And, you know, even though they were of that time period, hey, you know, I don't think that the feeling of hunger has changed much. If you get hungry, you can relate to that, can't you? You can relate to them people being hungry because you've probably been hungry. You've not been starving to death, of course, but you've probably been hungry. Think of the blessings that we have that, I mean, I, I, I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever thought about dying of starvation. In, Mark, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 15, and when it was evening, well, let's uh, start, but go back up to 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship, Matthew 14, 13, into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed the sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals or food. And Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And the loaves aren't, you know, when I picture a loaf of bread, I picture, you know, this nice big old loaf. It's kind of probably it's just a little biscuit or a wafer or something like that. And two little bitty fishes, like a sardine. And you know, there's been a lot of speculation about what this five and what this, what does the five loaves mean and what does the two, lo uh, two little fishes mean? And I don't, other than this, I think this kind of, to me, what this be, is this, the significance of it. This was their everyday food, everyday food. It wasn't a big banquet. It was just every day food, nothing new. But when the Lord, and it's so few, how, how can 5,000 be fed with this? Well, enters the power of God. Jesus was moved with compassion. The millions, billions of people in the world. But anyway, he says, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and he took five loaves and two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did eat and were filled and they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. The disciples that fed the multitude were able to carry away with them 12 baskets. Each one of them had their own basket to carry with them. So that they would never forget what God can do. There was one time when they were on the ship and the winds came and everything started getting kind of nervous for those that were on the ship. And he says, have you forgotten already the 12 baskets full? Remember that. I am a God of compassion and strength and mercy and power. I can do all things. Look at that basket and remember. There's many applications to this. But I think one of the one application that I take with me is this. 
that the ministers of the Lord take this book and it cannot be distributed to the multitude unless Christ would take it and bless it and break it up. It cannot be given to the multitude unless Christ is in the matter. The spirit does the work to where there is a preaching in the power and the demonstration of the spirit. And I believe that the significance of these five, this five loaf and these two little fishes is there's nothing new. <laughs> there's nothing new that they need to bring. If God blesses this, you know, the apostle Paul says, I preached only Christ and Christ crucified. I have one message to deliver to the children of God, the same barley loaves and the same fishes. Every time I meet with a multitude or a gathering of God's people and the blessing of God, he makes it new and they are filled. There's no addition that needs to be given to the minister of the word of God, except the power and the moving of the spirit upon him and the listeners in the congregation. And in that, I mean, I wonder if they had ever been truly filled. That's kind of a peasant meal. I wonder if they ever had been truly able to eat and say, man, I'm full, I don't want any more. Or if it was like, no, we can't eat this. We gotta, we can't, we can't, we can't satisfy all this hunger. But that day, when the Lord touched it, and when the Lord Jesus Christ gave thanks and blessed it, they were filled. They were satisfied. You know, the Bible is just full of his, you know, and I, and I use the word story a lot, but I don't want, I, I don't want to, I want to use historical accounts, factual historical accounts, when everything just seems so small and everything else is just so big, but in the power of God, we are so big and everything else is so small. There was a giant named Goliath that was nine to 10 feet tall. The whole nation of Israel was afraid of the giant. There was a giant down and then the whole congregation of Israel were up on the hill. The king wouldn't go down to take on Goliath, a giant, a giant. But you know, the anointed of the Lord, David, a shepherd, came bearing cheese and wine for his brethren. And David saw the circumstance. And David said, in the name and in the power of the Lord, I will go down and fight Goliath and slay him. And you know, that's what happened. All four accounts of the gospel. It's of great significance when the children of God, including the ministers, <coughs> is five barley loaves and these two fishes is sufficient when the Lord takes it and gives thanks and blesses it and it's distributed to the multitude. There's nothing else that needs to be added. Nothing else that needs to be added. Nothing else should be taken away. You know, we don't just need four barley loaves and we don't just need one fish or we don't need seven of them and we don't need three of them. It's what we have in this, what God has given us. This, this whole kingdom of God is God's kingdom. 
This church that he set up here is God's kingdom. He set it up. Who is the smartest person that you know? Who is the most genius person that you know? Would you say God or Christ or? Well, let me ask you this. Now think about this. If Christ set up this kingdom for his people, do you think he forgot anything that his people would need to worship in when he set it up? Do you think he said, well, you know, maybe in about 10 years they could add this because this is going to happen, or 20 years they could add this, or this is going to happen? Surely not. God is all knowing, all knowledgeable. Everything that God does is just and righteous. So if God has established something, think about this. Who are we to try to change it? Should it be changed? If God has set something up, should it change? It says that we should not add to or take away from the word. We shouldn't add to or take away from the kingdom. We shouldn't add to or take away from the way he has designed for us to worship. You will enjoy reading that account in each of the four gospels. Now, the Apostle Paul in his ministry, as well as Peter, as well as all of the ministers, the event that the Old Testament points to is the day that the Savior, the Son of Man, and the Son of God will go to the cross at Calvary and redeem his people from their sins. That is known as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Every gospel account accounts for that event. They speak about when Jesus Christ was taken to the cross to be crucified. That is given. Now, in prophecy, that's given to us in Psalm 22. Now, it was important, I believe, to God. It must be because that's what his Bible is about. The Old Testament is, is leading and turning the children of Israel and pointing them to be on the ready to identify when their Savior is born into this world and their Savior goes to the cross because of his grace and his mercy and redeems them from their sins. He wants them to be able to identify that's the lamb that's the son of god that's the son of man psalm 22 talks about the crucifixion now it might not have been understood a lot about the crucifixion when this psalm was written because the children of Israel hadn't experienced probably or even witnessed a crucifixion before. But in Psalm chapter 22, 15 and 16, I want you to notice this. See, this lamb that I'm telling you about that's going to come in and his blood will cleanse you from all sins will not just die, will not just be put to death, but he will be crucified. My strength in Matthew, uh, Psalm twenty-two, fifteen. 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They have pierced my hands and my feet, meaning they have driven spikes nails through my hands and through my feet they have crucified me they have nailed me to this piece of wood that we reference as the cross 
That's crucifixion. Dogs, uh, the children of Israel would have identified that term. It's not like a German shepherd or something like that. The Gentiles were considered dogs. You see, the Jews themselves couldn't kill a murder. They were under subjection to the Roman law, so they took them to some Romans. And the Romans, the dogs, the Gentiles, those soldiers put that nail in the flesh of Christ. But we know for the purpose of that nail going into Christ was the purpose of the death of the Son of God. And it wasn't just the Romans that placed that nail there, but it was every one of the sins that Jesus Christ came to save. We, I had as much to do with the nails going in his hands and his feet as the Romans did that had the hammer and pounded it through. Does that make sense? If it weren't for the sins of the people, there would have been no crucifixion of the Son of God. But since there was the sins of the people of God, there was a crucifixion of the Son of God. So what's the significance of the death of Jesus Christ? Matthew talks about it. The last four chapters are, are several chapters of each gospel account leads us to the crucifixion, the significant event, the significant as historical, historically, as historically accurate was the feeding, is the feeding of the 5,000, so is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's an actual historical event that took place in time. John chapter 19, there was the trial. Verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto him, to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called the, in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other were with him and two other with him on the either side on either side one and Jesus in the midst. They crucified, they killed the Lord Christ. What is the significance of that? One, that we know who they're talking about. We understand that this points to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Then we have an understanding of if God died for that purpose. Now it says that he was delivered. I want to give this to you in Acts chapter 2. Peter's sermon to the people in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders 
and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Romans took him. The Jews bound him, delivered him. Romans placed him at the cross. They nailed the, the, nails, the spikes through his hands. But it says this. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In all eternity, dearly beloved, God would send his son to redeem his people from their sins and be crucified at the cross at Calvary for the full reconciliation and redemption. That is the ransom that had to be paid. And dearly beloved, it was paid. The ransom was paid. When Christ was crucified, his blood was shed. When he died at the cross at Calvary, that is the picture and redemption of the people of the, of the family of God. That is full redemption, full redemption, not partial redemption. Not just some of the sins of some of the people of God, but all of the sins of all of the people of God had been redeemed at that time at the cross at Calvary when Christ was crucified. You know, hundreds, 700 years before that, that historical event would happen, another historical event took place. There was a prophet named Isaiah that prophesied to the kingdom of Israel. And he told them this. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice how Peter turned away. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. This is pointing to Christ our Lord. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, who shall declare his generation? Notice this. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken, referring to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yet it, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering of sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. My righteous, by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. The Lord Jesus Christ, while he was at the cross at Calvary, bore the iniquities of all of God's family on him. Uh, the apostle Peter tells us that who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. First Peter 2, 24. Now, we see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John being inspired by God right of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He was taken and he was placed in a borrowed tomb. You know what? As historically...
as truthful as that historical event is, that Jesus Christ, the Son of Man and Son of God, was crucified at the cross at Calvary. There's also another event that the Lord inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to write about. And that's the historical, historical event of the resurrection of the same Jesus Christ that was crucified at the cross at Calvary. Matthew reports that they run to the tomb, they, where the stone has rolled away, they looked in and they did not see the body of Jesus Christ. Mark reports the same incident, they go to it and they're looking and they said, someone has taken the body of Jesus Christ. You remember in Matthew, the, the, uh, the chief priest says now, soldiers, if somebody asks you where the body, and this is when the tomb was over, if somebody asks you where the body of Christ is, you lie and say, well, when we were asleep, the uh, disciples came and they rolled it away and then they took the body of Christ. But dearly beloved, it says in John chapter 20, historical accurate event. Historical accurate event. In chapter 20 of St. of John, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. The tomb is empty. What's the significance of that? Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying yet he went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not laying in the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they know not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. What's the significance of Jesus? Jesus Christ's resurrection. Now, that, all they have seen is an empty tomb. But it would be very shortly and that they would see the resurrected Christ. It wasn't, it wasn't a secret to the population at that time that only the disciples, the immediate inner circle, would witness Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see this, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 15 chapter four, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12, after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once. 500 eyewitnesses at that period of time saw the resurrected Lord at once, anyone, 500. But some of them have fallen asleep at the time of Paul's writing. But if you weren't there, imagine this. If you didn't get to see it, you had 500 people to go to ask about it. Did you see Christ? Yes, I did. Did you see Christ resurrected? Yes, I did. Did you see that? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. 500 yes, I did among the apostles and the apostle Paul. Dearly beloved, this is historical. 
This is an event which saved God's people from their sins. The significance of that. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, notice this, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? Because that's what they preached about. They preached about the resurrected Jesus Christ, their Lord. Your faith is also in vain because you believe uh, you have the faith that Christ rose from the dead and his resurrection, Jesus would say, because I live, ye shall live also. If Christ doesn't live, then we won't live also. But Christ is alive, therefore we will live also. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. That means they haven't been paid for. That means the ransom hasn't been paid. Hasn't been paid. That means there has been no redemption for Lord's people. If then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since, for since by man came death, by man came also, by, by man, the man, Christ Jesus, came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his first order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God. Historical, accurate event. That happened. That took place. That should be on the front page of every news every day but it never will be because that's not the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is here the kingdom of god is here that should be on the front page of our news every day don't you think that jesus christ is alive that jesus christ is resurrected from the dead that jesus christ is alive in that body and he's seated at the right hand of god and he he is the one that's making intercession for me. He is the one that is able to save me. He is the able to, he has saved me from every sickness, every trial and tribulation. And if he doesn't, aren't you thankful that he's promised that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you, that you will feel the comforting power of God through every trial, through every tribulation. He's strong. He's got all power. And as much power as he has, he's got that much love and compassion and mercy towards his people. But you see, all I can do is report this to you. And the Lord has to take it and apply it. See, these are spiritual things that need to be spiritually discerned. And if you hadn't been born again of the Spirit, you may be able to point to him and say, yeah, that's true. There was that man called Jesus Christ. And he died and he was crucified. But dearly beloved, if you've been quickened by the Spirit and you have received this news and God convicts your heart and shows you that how we were sinners, but yet now we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, do you see how we can take those five loaves and two fish and you can have that and be filled and rejoiced and go your way with your little 12 basket? The basket's full. It's full. You know, we need nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That's what completes us in the sight of God. And it's given to us all throughout the scripture. May God add his blessing. May we rejoice in the five loaves and the two fishes. And if God will bless it, we will fill it and be refreshed 
and have a sense and be able to take hold of our eternal life. Uh, the doors of the church are open for the reception of members. If there's any that would like to have a home here, you have the opportunity to let it be known as we stand and sing a hymn. Brother Gene, what number? 421. Four twenty one. I heard an old story. Our Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save the wretch like me. I heard about his money.